I was always like a big like um like sci-fi like 80s of Star Wars, Aliens, Predator, Terminator, and RoboCop. Like yeah. that was like my jam, man. Like all well, them. RoboCop. RoboCop's the shit, man. <laughs> RoboCop was classic. Is that what? Well, Cla- let's, let's talk about. So let's go ahead and ki- officially like kick this off. Then Matthew Klein you got, got you on the podcast. Appreciate it, man. You're Army Infantry, and then you know got blown up. Purple Heart got out of the army. Went to the NYPD to be a, a sketch artist, which is super crazy. That's like a. Yeah. That feels like a dying art, right? Like, is that a, you gotta, yeah. you gotta like maintain your relative or, uh, your, uh, what am I trying to say? Maintain your relevance. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. So let's start, let's start from the beginning with the army. What made you decide to join the army and the infantry? Cause this was pre nine 11. You joined in 99, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, what do you call it? Actually? No, I, I, I joined after nine 11. The, um, what do you call it? No, I was just, um, with the whole military experience and stuff, like I grew up, my dad was an artist. That's where I got my talent from and everything like that. Mm. And, um, but like, it was always feast and famine. Being, uh, being a professional artist is a rough career. For so sure. you do very well. You want to do that well. So I kind of like, I didn't really know what I was doing this and that. And um, growing up, my grandfather was a world war two veteran and he was a dive bomber pilot in the Pacific. He was on the U S Ticonderoga. He fought at Guadalcanal, Iwo Jima, a lot of battles. That's and he used crazy. To it, it was wild. His brother was in the European theater with the 18th Airborne Corps, I believe. He was a navigator on B-17, got shot down over Germany and died. Damn. So, like, growing up with all those stories, and he always told me very vivid stories of, like, the war in the Pacific and everything. And, you know, it, that one movie that came out like, a couple years ago, Midway, the mm. main character is around a, a, a dive bomber pilot, which my grandfather was. So it was cool seeing, like, a Miguel Douglas Dauntless dive bomber doing all the different stuff that he did you know yeah going in and bombing targets and stuff so growing up with that 9-11 kicks off and i remember him vividly telling me about pearl harbor and he was just like him and his brother were just ah they all signed up they wanted to get into the fight 9-11 the same kind of thing and um when that you know when that kicked off and everything i saw the invasion of iraq getting ready to go and I just wanted to get in there and get into the fight, you know, just, I really wasn't doing anything. And I just felt like the calling to go, you know, prove myself and see what it is and, um, get out there. Were you open to any branch or were you like army all the way? I always like, as a kid growing up, I remember like going to like a County fair mm-hmm. and the national guard were there and they had some Humvees with tow missiles and everything. And they let me sit in there and I got to wear their hats. And I just always remember really liking the army especially with like um you know rangers special forces delta like i just really i was really drawn more to the army than the other branches Mm -hmm. yeah i mean i was also until i read marine sniper and that was kind of what my dad was army yeah yeah yeah. so that's kind of what flipped me like man those dudes are badass like marines are awesome that's why i just you know that's cool though like we so i don't have too many soldiers on here how what was the like transition like what was boot camp and then infantry training like because for those that don't know unlike marine corps boot camp there's two of them and everybody goes to those Mm. two either one of those two army has like mos specific ones so like if you're already you go to fort sill for boot camp if you're infantry you go to benning right yep fort benning yeah like how's that it it was good so fort benning infantry you do o set so it's one-stop training so, like, in the Army, you have basic training in AIT, your advanced individual training. So, like, if you're a medic, you do basic somewhere. Then you do your medic training somewhere else. So, infantry, they do it all together. I believe it's, like, five or six months. And um, I remember, like, just going through it. And then, like, one day, somebody's like, are we in AIT? Are we in infantry school yet? And the drill sergeant's like, yeah, that was, like, three weeks ago, dude. Like, you're still here. <laughs> so, you just you just do that. And then um, you go to your unit. But um, it was good. You know, it was good. Uh you know, it was cool. It, it's interesting, like all the different people that I ran into and like where they ended up and this and that. And um, there was um, one of the guys in my platoon was the brother of a Black Hawk Down, uh, one of the platoon sergeants. So like and then like that movie came out and everything. So that was kind of cool. But, um, you know, it was interesting. And looking up people years later on, like I remember like one of the most times I ever, the most upset I ever was about any of my friends ever getting killed was my platoon guide and my lost contact years after, you know, um, going through basic training and everything. But I remember going through the casualty list, like randomly, like after I got out of the army and I saw his name and he was actually killed in theater when I was there in 2005. That really, really hurt. But, um, yeah, man. you know, 
It was I a good experience, though. Yeah, I haven't I looked. Do. I haven't looked up anybody from my boot camp. You know, you I, there's a couple guys I kept up with for a while, and then I guess we kind of fell off. I think we still follow each other on social, but yeah, I'm kind of like that's. I'd hate to look back and find out something like that happened. You know? Yeah, that's got to be like, oh fuck, you know? Yeah, he was a legend. Like to me, he was like he was the platoon guy. He was like the soldier of the cycle, the best shooter. He was fucking. He was a fucking stud. He went to sniper school. He did everything, and he, he got he got blown up by an ID in uh, 2005. God rest his soul, man. Damn, but, man. Um, you know that's tough. Crazy. So in the Marines, um, in the Marines, the infantrymen go to SOI, the School of Infantry, and then they go to ITB, which is the Infantry Training Battalion within SOI. When they get there, they all they all train together, and then at a certain point, they get broken up down to their specialties. Like you're a machine gunner, you're this, you're a mortarman, you know, you're that. Is the army similar, or do you guys just go through and learn everything? So when I went through, they had they got rid of they used to have like was it four? They had eleven Bravo, which is light infantry, eleven Mac, uh, Mike, which is mechanized infantry, like in Bradley's. Then they had eleven Hotel, which is anti tank infantry. So it's like tow missiles and um, dragons at the time, or j- javelins just dragons, started yeah. coming in. Yeah, and then um, the eleven Charlies was through the mortar guys, and so I went in as like a eleven hotel, and then they told us like, yeah, they got rid of the program, and they're like, they started doing the eleven X ray program where everybody was going to get cross trained. They were going to take, they were going to specially train the mortar guys, and like so. My battle buddy, he was a mortar guy. So, like, we all trained, and then, like, he went away for, like, a w- two weeks. He would go train somewhere else with a drill sergeant that knew how to do shit about mortars and go to the mortar range. But pretty much you get to your unit, then you go from there. So I went to 3rd Infantry Division, which was all mechanized. So once I got there, I got all the training on, you know, with Bradleys and stuff like that. I I was going to be a Bradley driver for, like, a hot second. But I, my whole time in 3rd Infantry Division, I was a dismount. So I was just an infantry guy that rode around in the back of the Bradley hmm. and would dismount and do infantry operations. No, Now, do you guys normally have the junior guy be the driver? So usually, like, <laughs> the squared away guys, you know, vehicle's a lot of pain in the ass. It's a lot of maintenance. You know, it's a lot of respect to those guys because they're constantly making sure it's running and stuff. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, sometimes the junior guys go there. It's kind of like they kind of size you up and see – you know, like what you're going to, you know, where you're going to be. And also, um, but I ended up just being a dismount, which was great, you know, because all I had to worry about was my weapon systems and, you know, squad and platoon tactics and all that stuff like that, where the guys be in the motor pool. Yeah. No, it's, (laughs) it's crazy being, imagine being like 19 or 20 and they're like, all right, here's this 30 ton vehicle. (laughs) You're not in charge of, we're going to take it out on the highway. It's fun. Yeah. I, I drove it a couple of times, but like, that was the extent of, uh, me doing it i remember so when i first came in i was a mechanic and then i lap moved over to be a ford observer but when i was a mechanic i w- was sent to south carolina before i went to iraq to uh, i went there to learn how to work on the the uh buffalo mrap that's the big ass okay. one that has the arm on it you know um I actually worked on the one that was in the first transformer movie you see it skating at the end oh yeah yeah, yeah. yeah they welded a big they welded a decepticon logo on the back door of it um so when that's we, awesome. but when we got there, they're like, Hey, we're going to, you guys are going to learn how to work on these and you're going to learn how to drive them. And we're like, okay, whatever. And we got there like the day before the Marine Corps birthday. And then <laughs> the Marine Corps birthday was that night. We, you know, the, there was a few Marines in the class. We went out and just got smashed. And then the next day they're like, all right, we're going to drive the, this Buffalo, which is massive for people that don't yeah. know. Look it up. Buffalo MRAP. It's got to be at least 50,000 pounds. I mean, it's a no, massive vehicle. And um, we're all half hung over. And they're like, all right, we're going to drive it around the parking lot. And then you're going to back it into a spot. And once you do that, you're good. And then we're going to take it out on the highway. And it was just like, holy shit. Man. You know, like, <laughs> but it's just crazy imagining like you're out here driving this massive vehicle after just doing one lap around a parking lot. And it's like, all right, let's do it. Let's you know, it. like out on the streets. Yeah. But that's the military, right? <laughs> Yeah, I know. Like, like I was never qualified to drive a Bradley or qualified to drive a Humvee, and I just, you know, drove a couple times, you know, in Iraq. Qualified to like drive that. a just, I mean, if you have like, a driver's license, you should be qualified to drive a yo, Humvee. Yo, but technically, you know, the MPs might pull me over. You know? <laughs> they make such a big deal about getting a Humvee license and stuff like that. It's like, dude, just, it's literally like almost any other car. If you don't, I mean, it'd be, exactly. it'd be good to get some like uh, instruction on off roading, you know, how to yeah. use four wheel drive properly because yeah. some dudes don't know how to, mm-hmm. what the difference between four low and four high is. 
Um, but besides that, you know, so when you, as were you guys, if you're a dismount, how many dismounts are there in a Bradley? So an infantry squads, what is it? It's supposed to be and, and like on paper, it's supposed to be like nine guys. And then it, in real life, it ends up being like maybe like six, seven dudes. So in a, the way organization for a Bradley platoon at like peak is each platoon has four Bradleys and there's two infantry squads divided up between the two. So I was in um, the first, I was in first squad. I was in the lieutenant's Bradley. So the, the lieutenant has his own Bradley. The crew is gunner, commander, driver. So you have three guys in that Bradley, second Bradley. And then the second Bradley would have the rest of my squad there. So my I always heard all the, like the main traffic because my lieutenant would be yelling down to my sergeant, my squad leader, and then I had a team leader. So in the back of the Bradley, so my team was only three dudes. I had a team leader. It was me and um, another guy who was a squ uh, saw gunner, you know, squad automatic guy. And mm -hmm. then I had my squad lead. My squad leader was riding it. Then the other Bradley would have three to four guys in there, you know, team leader, a squad. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, squad automatic guy and, uh, and other two dudes running in there. And then we had we had uh, what two a weapons team, two weapons teams. So we had two M240 Bravos with their with a sergeant and like two other guys. And they would kind of like float around between the Bradleys. But um, that was the whole platoon, you know, so you had like the maneuver element, you know, anytime we attack something, we have like two Bradleys go in, two Bradleys overwatching, you know. And, but, and um, the Bradley has a 25 millimeter gun, right? Yeah. So the Bradley's a, got a 25 millimeter chain gun. It's got a, a 240 Charlie coaxial machine gun, and then it has two tow missiles. It, it's nasty. I, you know, I see all this stuff. They made that movie back in the day, the Pentagon Papers, like how shitty, the, oh, the Bradley's crap. Yo, the Bradley is nasty, man. Mm -hmm. Like we, and um, there was a lot of engagements we got into where Bradleys were just opening up 25 millimeter chain gun and just ruining cars, houses, people, like <laughs> fucking, fucking shit up. That's how they are with the LAVs too. Yeah. They're, yeah, that's they, wild. Well, yeah, no, they're, they're, and they had reactive armor. Like my Bradley got hit four times. I was in the back for three of them and it took all the hits, you know, like and they had reactive armor on it and everything. And, hit by uh, what? IEDs, IEDs. Okay. So I was gonna buddy, ask if how how they fared in IEDs because they do sit kind of low. Yeah, no, they 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 everyone like the first we my I was in the first Bradley to hit an IED and um when I went my second tour in two thousand five and um it took the fucking hit man we just kept rolling through and I remember it clear as day like my ex wife was pregnant at the time and I'm look we're leaving a mission. And I'm like, I wonder if my boys, my uh, my my kids gonna be a boy or a girl. Boom! And fucking IED ripped right through. Holy shit! And like, yeah. And like, we kept driving. The whole back filled up with smoke. Now the commander and uh, my lieutenant was hanging out the hatch, so he got debris thrown in his face. So you hear him coughing on the radio, and the gunner's like, "I'm okay, okay." And they start yelling, "Like everybody okay?" And I look through the smoke, and my squad leader just gives me a thumbs up. And it, the Bradley's still driving. And my lieutenant screaming on the radio, like Hefner, who was the driver. He's like, are you, are you okay, bro? Are you okay? Okay. And you just hear like, <clears throat> I'm fine. So we drive through the kill zone. You know, that was like the, the ROE was just to fucking roll out of it. We roll out of it. We come to a stop. We jump out. We're all alive and shit. We're all fucking high five each other. We're like, we hit the first ID, motherfuckers. <laughs> and um, the second Bradley comes rolling up. They all jump out. They're all celebrating. We're like, what are you celebrating? Like, we hit an ID. We're like, fucking bullshit, bro. We blew it hit us. So we start arguing, and my lieutenant's like, shut the fuck up. We hit the ID, and we had and like held up like pieces of debris that were like fell on our Bradley, and like, you know, everybody high fived, and then uh, we rolled out. That's hilarious. <laughs> you guys were like celebrating. So that was the yeah. first time a Bradley ever hit an ID? No, no, no. That was the first time your that unit we hit, we hit one. Yeah. So 2005 was like, I, I, I did two tours in Iraq. My first tour wasn't very uneventful, I missed the invasion. I went, the invasion kicked off uh, March 19th. So my unit, my company, they all blew through. That's another example, like the Bradleys and the tanks. Mm -hmm. So a lot of dismounts didn't see too much action in my, my company. The, the, the Bradley crews saw shit tons of fucking action. Like one of my, my buddies, Gunner, he, he was at the Carbala Gap. It was a turkey shoot. That, then the, and the tank crews were just lighting everything. So I got there as a replacement l later on when um people had emergency leave people got hurt people had reasons to go back they sent us in so i went in with a scattered group of guys i joined up with my unit in um iraq in baghdad in 2003 you know a couple missions and raids here and there and stuff and pretty much not too eventful 
what it was was my opinion was the um the insurgencies the iraqis got their their asses handed to them and they were just the insurgency was in its infancy and was just trying to just starting to figure out how to kill americans like the ieds everything started to start coming about first armor division came in and replaced us and um they came in with all the light like, vehicle all, all the horror stories like from the beginning was mostly first infantry division and the, and the marines they were they were in there with like the light equipment and everything and the insert ied started going and that's so we left we left in september september october we got back to third id um fort stewart we did another train up and then we went back to iraq in 2005 so that's like pre-surge and like that's when like we, we you know we went in there and that's where i saw all the action and everything and um it was pretty wild because you heard all the stories coming back from um you know going, when we we're in 2004 hearing all the stories all the horror going on over mm-hmm. in iraq so we're all training for it the one another good side note my um my platoon my unit and everything there wasn't a lot of uh, changeover so a lot of the guys in my company and my platoon and stuff were all bad motherfuckers from the invasion and everybody was like we ain't getting killed this time so we all went in there like hard chargers and 2005 was uh blood and guts <laughs> that's crazy man that's um i mean it's still funny that you guys are celebrating your first ied strike like, Yo, yeah, I, I, I have a photo of it too oh really I, I, I had the driver hold up he had a bunch of uh debris and stuff you'll have to send that to me so i could share it yeah, yeah i'll send it to you yeah that'll be cool there was a couple <laughs> there was a couple like like one of my buddies in second platoon he was a bradley driver and he got hit Two RPGs hit him. One, one day, he was um, rolling in the gate back to our patrol base, and a guy hit him in the side. Reactive armor, so the RPG penetrated the reactive armor. The reactive armor blew out. The next, so I see him, and I'm like, "Yo, that's fucking awesome!" So he takes a picture, you know. So the next day, he's rolling out to a mission. Guy jumps out in front of the arm, hits in the front of the Bradley, boom, with an RPG, and um, hit the reactive armor. Reactive armor blew back out. So he had another freaking hole. They end up killing that dude, but um. Just, just like the random stuff that was just going on like day to day. It sounds like the armor on it's pretty badass. I never rode in a Bradley. I never, I mean, I saw him around, but I never actually rode in one. I've heard, you, you brought up that movie Pentagon Papers, which is weird. I was watching a podcast or something the other day and they were just talking about it. But it how, yeah. and for those that don't know, it's like basically like the acquisition process and they specifically talk about the Bradley and they make it out to be like this very like horrible vehicle that's just getting pushed through to like make money for the company or whatever. But you, you disagree with that premise, I guess you think it's uh yeah, you love from that. What I, yeah. From what I saw, because, you know, in the, I, I, I saw the movie a long time ago, but the thing was, yeah, they were trying to a lot of bureaucracy. They're trying to push this big thing through and it has all these features that it's really not good at anything and this and that, but like, it was a support by fire element. It has thermals, so it's seen people in trees and bushes. It has 25 millimeter chain gun that shoots armor piercing and high explosives, so it's blowing through houses and vehicle, light vehicles. And then it has a tow missile launcher, which it can launch into vehicles. You know, God forbid it runs into like a tank or something, or a building. You know, like shoot tow missiles at the buildings. You mm-hmm. got some insurgents. We're taking fire from the second uh, floor. Tow missile into it, and now you have your problem's taken care of. And then you have a coaxial machine gun. You know. So um, it's just an awesome, you know, um, support by fire element that called up, you know, a lot of the missions we do, we'd sneak around and stuff. And um, we always had Brad, like our Brad, you know, being quiet would be on the city. And then like a couple of miles away, we'd have the Bradleys waiting, you know, guys hanging out in the vehicles, GRF, in case we start screaming on the radio, they can fucking roll up and, you know, help us out zoom in real fast yeah yeah like the lav man that gun that 25 millimeter chain gun is not to be messed with and the optics on that thing is good you know they can see you they will see you out at a distance we had when i was in afghanistan and southern helmand province was a pretty open kind of open desert area and that was lar you know uh light armored uh, reconnaissance battalions ao because they would just cruise around the desert with their optics and could see for you know forever Um, yeah yeah, it's definitely a good capability. What were your guys' missions like? You know, what what was like an average? Were you you're not out on presence patrols on a Bradley, right? No. Nah. <laughs> so no. Um. So we got there. So I'll give you like my big tour with 2005. I'll give you the, I'll give you like the setting and everything like that. So Samara, it's in the what is it? The Bloody Triangle, the, the Crazy Triangle in Iraq, whatever. I don't, the deadly, I don't know. I can't <laughs> deadly <remember>. Triangle. <laughs> So during the invasion, they bypassed a lot of the cities and stuff, and they went to, like, all the main ones. So it's north of Baghdad. So 
they would occasionally go in there, this and that, but and like get attacked and ambushed and stuff. So Big Red won first uh, infantry division. Those are the ones we relieved. So they went in there on it in 2004. They went in there for like a presence patrol and got to a huge shit um, battle and shit in two, in April 2004. They came back out. They're like, yeah, we're gonna just stay out of there. There's no reason to go in there. So occasionally they'd have to do missions in and out of there. And every time they do, they just run into just ambushes because the insurgents would have everything set up for them, this and that. So they came to the decision in October of 2004 that they were going to do Operation Baton Rouge. Operation Baton Rouge was like Fallujah. They were going to go in there and attack, fight the insurgents, and they were going to establish a, a patrol base right in the middle of the city so they can constantly have 24-7. They got to have eyes on the insurgency and, like, fight them. Like, there was these, like a middle finger to them. Like, you can't do shit. We're here. Mm -hmm. So October, I think it was October 19th, correct me, um, they went in there and they killed, like, 150 people. They, like, lit the whole friggin' city up. They went in there. They took over a school building in the middle of the city. And they destroyed buildings around it, fortified it, sandbagged it, and made it patrol base Uvani, named after a Pennsylvania National Guard guy that was there during the invasion and got killed. So they got attacked all the time. We So we deployed to Kuwait. We're getting ready to go up there. They sent the lieutenant, and he was telling us, uh, like, you know, this is what they're doing. They're putting IEDs in dead animals. They put IEDs in telephone poles. They, they, they send kids out to, you know, spot for, um, you know, mortar fire, like, they were just telling us all these crazy um, different stuff. So like, we're like, all right, we're going to go. So so we're hearing all the, the stuff about it. Now, the closest Florida's observation base to the city was Brassfield Mora. So that's where we went. We got our vehicles all ready, and then we went into the Samara. So we, we go in there. And day one is pretty wild, too. Like, like uh, That's the one thing is, like, so many flavors of stories from uh, this deployment. Like, mm -hmm. you're just like, oh, what flavor do you want? So... We were rolling in, and it's funny. It was back in the day. We had um, when the iPods first came out, the clicky ones, the yeah, click, yeah. click, click. So my gunner had it wired into um, what do you call it? into the Bradley. So we hear over the radio. You hear all the radio transmissions, and then you can hear music playing in the background nice. and stuff. So funny. You see some heavy metal. So we roll up, and like we've seen pictures of this, you know, photographs and like computer pictures and stuff. What the place looks like, and um, so we roll up. We're going through and we're, I'm a dismount. So all I can hear is on the, you know, the year of the intercoms. And then you hear, you see through the periscopes on the back. It's really dark. We roll up, the ramp drops. It's all dusty. And it's like, you see this school building and it's completely, it's like two stories. It's like an L shape, completely um, berms. You could see rubble of all the houses around it. They blew them up. The engineers came and destroyed them because they want a clear line to fire. Mm -hmm. You know, this place would get attacked all the time. So we roll up, we meet some of the first infantry division guys, and they are grizzled vets, man. I think they were 226. I think they had like 75% like Purple Hearts. Like these guys were like through, through it. So we go in there, we're bringing all our shit, and um, we go into like their little dining facility, which is like a little, just like a little lunchroom thing. We go in there, and then. Um, one of my squad leaders comes running through the door. He's like, yo, you hear like a, you hear like an explosion outside. And I'm like, what happened? He's like, yo, a mortar just landed. In the, where were we just where? A mortar just landed. They're like, get the fuck out of here. It's like, oh, I just landed. So he's like, yo, this place is crazy. So we go, go in and it was, um, we stayed on the third floor, second floor. We go in and all the classrooms are converted into rooms for all the different soldiers and everything. So they give us one room for my whole platoon. They're like, yo, this is where you're going to stay. Once we move out, you guys can move in and take over our rooms. Like, okay. While we're doing this, there's bunkers on the roof. Camo netting, 24, you know, 24-7 security, detailed out. 240 Bravo machine guns, Mark 19 grenade launchers on top. And you just hear them going off. Yo. Know, hundreds and hundreds of rounds are getting dumped and we're all sitting there in the room like this and there's like dust coming down and we're sitting there like this is going to be a good 365 days to be uh entertaining <laughs> yo crazy so i look and i'm like shit i forgot my assault pack I, I had my rucksack and like a duffel bag i'm like i gotta get my assault pack it's at the bradley so i'm like fuck so i'm like how do i get out of here so the guy's like oh I'll just go down the stairs make a left make a right and i, I go down so i walk out and you know they have the they have, um, what do you call it, the Hemet trucks. We had fuel trucks. Mm -hmm. They dug out the ground, so they were like under, like half submerged under the dirt, you know, to protect them from incoming fire and stuff. And I see all the Bradleys and everything, so I walk down, and there's some Humvees. So there's a couple of Iraqi Army guys hanging out, like a small contingent of them. 
some first infantry division guys with their Bradleys. That's another thing too, is the first infantry divisions from Germany, all their vehicles are all green and, um, you know, uh, woodland camouflage because of, you know, the, the, uh, European in case theater. it was in Europe. Yep. During uh, the cold war, our vehicles are all tan because <clears throat> they're all desert storm stock. So I can't find my Bradley. I'm looking, I'm like, Oh shit. So my Bradley's all the way over in the corner getting fueled. So I'm like, all right, whatever. I'm just gonna go back. When it comes back, I'll get it. So I turn around, boom, a fucking water hits right. Maybe like 50, 60 feet away from me. It hits between two Bradleys and it hits an Iraqi soldier and a first infantry division soldier talking. So it just hits, boom, fucking smoke. They go fucking hit. They both hit the ground. They start screaming. All these first infantry division guys dive on top of them, start grabbing them. So I'm just standing there like this. I, 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 I do a walk. And I start like doing a slow jog, like, what the fuck? <laughs> so fucking, I don't know where to go. So I kind of just walk. I like jog a little bit into the side room. I come in. They drag him in. They throw him on a stretcher. The Iraqi guy got, uh, I think, lost a finger, got shrapnel through his hand. And the first infantry division got shrapnel in his ass. So they're both fucking screaming and shit. And I'm just like, yeah. You know, everybody's like fucking pulling IVs out and everything. And then one of my squad leaders comes walking by and he's just like this. And I'm like, this is fucking crazy, man. This is going to be a fucking good deployment. <laughs> this is like day one. <laughs> yeah, it had to be Why like not? surreal, right? To be standing there and seeing that happen. Yeah, I saw I saw them both get fucking like hit right in front of me. Yeah, and I love the movies, right? You know, Michael Bay, Fireballs and shit. This is this there was none of that. It was just like poof, fucking giant dust cloud. Yeah. Everyone starts screaming. A bunch of dudes jumped on him. I mean, everybody in the world was there. And then I was just like, Okay, what do I do? Ah, <laughs> uh, I should get cover. So I went. But like that day, seven mortars came in there. And this is like a tiny, like a size of a football field. It, you know, mm-hmm. with with the base on top of it. So, like, this was not a small, uh, large area. Like, uh, you know, you, a lot of stories you hear, like, I was on a fob, I was on a big base, and a mortar blew up, like, you know, three miles away and shit. Like, these were hitting the, the, the roof that we were sleeping in, you know, by underneath. How but, did um, that continue throughout the entire deployment? I, I have to find it. I believe within the whole year, I think we took, like, 265 mortars within that small place. And we took, like, I think maybe, like, 45 RPGs hit the building. Like, mm-hmm. my room had an, a hole in it from an RPG that hit it, and it blew through. So, like, over my, my squad leader actually slept under it. There was, like, this giant hole that hit that freaking tore through. You know, like, one day I was taking a shower. I was in one stall. My squad leader was down in another stall, and we're sitting there, la, 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 and all of a sudden you hear AK fire from the – because we were right in the middle of the city. You hear AK fire, like, ha, 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 and then it hit the wall that that we were taking a shower behind. Oh, so I was like, oh, shit. I was like, yo, saw Roberts. I was like, he's like, whoa. I'm like, nobody has that fucking story. You know, rounds hitting the wall that you're taking a shower behind. But um, we were just crazy. always constantly, constantly under attack. It was. Uh, how effective were they, though? Did they ever like, I mean, how, I mean, RPG yeah. going through a wall. Most of the time, you're probably not going to hit anyone. But did it occasionally hit someone? We didn't have anybody hit with an RPG. But um, what like we had a guy. um. The first guy in our company got killed. Fuck day twelve, he got hit with a mortar. Him and another guy got hit, and so it was just always that fear of it might happening. So like the big thing was there's three types of mortars. It's like the fifth, uh, sixty. Correct me if I'm wrong. That wasn't a mortar guy. Sixty, eighty, and a one twenty. So the sixties and the eighty millimeters would hit, and they wouldn't penetrate the roof. Like the roof of our building had like small craters in it from those. Now a 120 would go through the fucking roof and kill us. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. they said they said one landed uh, like a block away from us. So there's always a fear that somebody had one out there. And I remember having nightmares. Sometimes I'd be sleeping and like our whole all the buildings are brick and cement. You know, I had a nightmare that this giant pillar that I slept underneath came down and crushed me. You oh, know, man. and like it just um happened. So the beginning of the deployment in the morning they would launch mortars and so we'd wake you know you'd wake up everybody run to their fucking post but by like halfway through the deployment we'd hear like mortars coming in and we'd be like we just go back to sleep like i <laughs> hope they don't call us out like it may or may not get me i don't know we'll see so but yeah not effective but it did it did harassing happen, you know? fire it's still it's it yeah. fucks with you mentally i'm sure there were yeah. guys that are really messed with you know after a while you start getting like when you see guys that are jumpy after deployments and shit like that that causes yeah them. yeah but yeah, that one guy though, Brangman, specialist Brangman, he was killed uh, day twelve, and um, he got hit with a mortar. And um, we were hiding out in an OP, and um, 
you know, just looking, nothing going on, hiding out. And then we heard, we heard mortars cooking off like boom, 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 in the distance. And then you hear them hitting the patrol base and we could see like the patrol base, you know, and landing. Mm-hmm. So we're like, ah, they're, you know, they're fucking doing some sporadic mortar fire, or whatever. Then we hear them screaming on the radio and they're like, oh, fucking, we need a medic down here now. Fucking this and that. So we're like, oh shit, somebody got really fucking hurt over there. So they, we see the um, a, a medic 113 armored personnel carrier and a bunch of Humvees and some Bradleys escorting them fucking fly out of there. And they drove right past where our street. So what 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 um what happened was when you went into our patrol base, there was a dirt berm around the motor pool and the the base itself. There was a uh, 113 armored personnel carrier with a 50 cal machine gun on it blocking the gate. So if anybody came up, that wasn't they would shoot them. So they were positioned there. So the guy Brangman was there. He was on the 50 cal, and another guy was down below. I don't remember his name. And he was sitting down, you know, keep pulling security, whatever. And a mortar blew up behind the arm uh the 113 so he was like fuck so he ducked and then he jumped up to see where it landed and the second round came in hit the edge of his hatch and fucking disemboweled him fucking oh, fuck. brutal, brutally wounded him and shrapnel went down below and hit the other soldier so they medically evac him they bring in the brassfield mora and that's it so that night we get picked up we didn't see shit on our on our op we get picked up we go back to our um, room and my lieutenant was staying in my room at the time so I go in, I'm in the only one in the bunk and everything. I'm sitting down, I'm going to go to sleep. And my squad leader comes, no, my uh, lieutenant comes in. He looks a little like a little upset. So I was like, hey, hey, sir, what's up? He's like, hey, what's going on? Fine. I was like, yo, Brangman, um, yo, is he going to be all right? Like, how's he doing? Is he going to make it? And he's like, no, Klein, Brangman is dead. And I'm like, okay. And I went to sleep and, uh, you know, rest in peace, man. That's, that's man weird. did that did that feel like there was a change in the environment after that like after the first guy got killed that you know yeah you know and um they did a ceremony for him at the fob so we literally jumped in our rallies we went there you know they the chaplain did a little prayer we saluted his boots we got back in the rallies went back on mission like within the you know an hour later but um yeah it just i remember how like just like you know it's not his fault or anything it's just like it was very like no client he's dead and um that's it he's probably you know a guy like that i mean i imagine having been like a staff nco having to like if you have to tell someone something like that you're probably have already gone through like a million emotions yourself yeah you know what i'm saying so he's probably just like you know just here's the cut and dry of it kind of deal yeah it's just you know what it is it's like in the movies everything's like oh slow motion and everything like that and it's just like he's not here with us anymore it's like all right you know and um i had a couple of friends that died that you know i was very fortunate not to be in the proximity of when they got killed but like all of them were like just like hey man klein yo so and so's dead i'm like get the fuck out of here you know it's like, just like this really takes the wind out of you just horrible yeah because it's it's like um i mean it's like a family member dying you can't imagine the rest of your life without that person being involved with it somehow you know, yeah. like contacting them or saying what's up to them or the little yeah. whatever it is you had with them, you know, like, yeah, man, that's tough. That's, uh, it is what it is though. You know, it's unfortunate. That's the job, you know? Yeah, no, it, it is. You know, it's just, um, we're playing for keeps, you know, it wasn't like, we weren't fucking around. It was, uh, it was a real fucking deal. And, um, uh, but going, going back to the question you asked though, when we got there, we did a lot of, we did, we did some presence patrols in the beginning and we were just getting attacked all the time. So we were trying to figure out ways to, um, to like, sh- like a strategy on how to like defeat them and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and occasionally we do some, um, operate, you know, we do some meet and greets. We'd meet out with the locals and stuff, trying to like build that friendship. The thing too, about the city, <clears throat> right before we got there, the government issued them, um, gave the local police department tons of, um, like glocks and weapons and stuff like that. <laughs> One of their precincts got ambushed and they killed like 30 of them. So they all quit. So all the police, there was no police at presence and uh, Iraq police presence at all in the city. So it was just Iraqi army. We had MOI, which was like the ministry of interior or something. I forget what they, what they represented it, but those were like the, the only guys that would come into the city. Mm-hmm. So it was like kind of us just going. So when we, we were trying to draw them out, we do is we'd like, we kind of bait them. We put, groups of guys on rooftops so we like half the platoon would be on a roof today 
and the other half would be hiding out, like waiting. So as soon as we took fire, we'd call it out and they'd flank around and try to get them. But like that really didn't, it worked sometimes, but not all the time. But the one thing we did that like wiped them out, like towards the middle of half was we do the, we do the OPs, like the killer hunter teams. We'd have all these four man teams sneak out into the city at night during curfew. The city had a curfew from like eight to like six in the morning. You were not allowed out. So we'd hide up in people's houses and just wait there and then sorry, wait for insurgents. So like hours, sometimes days, but then the insurgents would come out. You'd catch them digging holes, you know, sneaking around with weapons and stuff. And we just killed them that way. But that destroyed, you know, the, the insurgency that was there. How um, often were that, you guys using like indirect fire or, or like idea, you know, artillery or like air support? We had, um, so we had, um, what do you call it? The city was like really bad. So there was one supply route that would that logistics would come in and bring stuff. So we got hot food and mail three times a week. Every other meal was, you know, whatever your family mailed you or MREs. So this thing would always get attacked all the time. Yeah, you know, you know, it's crazy. Love it. the, MREs, you know, baby. G Watt originals. That's what I'm saying. You know, like we went to we went to some like big base spiker. We were like stealing food. Like, oh my god, there's Pizza Hut here, and like, what the fuck is this shit? Anyway. <laughs> This route was getting attacked all the time, and like the first time we pulled, we saw, we saw them get IED'd like fucking. So what they did was my CO said like fuck that. We we took over a couple houses along the route, and they were manned by a team of guys from the platoon. So I was just on top of the missions and everything else. So twenty four seven. So my platoon's OP was this one building that was facing the fields, and it was like on the outskirts of the cities. So we would get attacked we would call it up and they would call artillery on them. It just, it just unfortunate is like, we would call it out as fast as we could. By the time they dropped artillery out there or an Apache and a Kiowa warrior would come in, you, the insurgents were usually gone and stuff. So, but I, a lot of cool stories from that, you know, we, we would see like, um, I, I was up there, it was a little fortified base. We had a sniper, uh, sniper team up there once in a while with a 50 cal machine gun. And, um, we're hanging out there and like two guys, we had like four guys. There's like none of like nobody there. So me and another guy are up on the roof watching. And um, I'm sitting there, two other guys are down below sleeping. We got 50% security. It's like the day I'm listening to like sublime on my, my iPod <laughs> shuffle with a little speaker. And I'm looking and I just, I see dust in the distance, like go up. And I'm like, Oh shit. I'm like, yo, fucking waters are coming in. So they all come running up with their helmets and shit. And the, they, the mortars are coming for us. They're aiming for us, but they're hitting like a block over to the right. So we have a, a sniper fucking scope. We look out there, a spotter scope, and you can see they're shooting them from like these little white trucks. And I'm trying to remember, they were far as fuck. They were like 2,500, 3,000 meters or some shit. So I take the 240 Bravo and I'm just, um, I'm using it like a catapult in medieval times. I'm like shooting it, but I'm shooting like an arc. Mm -hmm. And the tracers burn out like 900 meters a thousand meters whatever so like you can kind of just gauge so i'm just like lobbing these fucking rounds just trying to get i'm not going to hit them but i, I just want to like light the area up around them so those rounds just going out there so they're like yo there's my sergeant's like yo they're stop they're stop shooting it the mortars yo they're jumping in the truck so you see like the little truck the truck's like driving away like oh we scared them off Woo, fuck those guys they stop the trucks they jump out with the mortars again and they start shooting oh, so you just hear like shoo, shoo. So my squad leader, he's calling it in. He calls it back to breath to the base, the breath feel more. And they're like, yo, artillery is coming in. So I'm like, fuck, where's my camera? I got my camera. So I get my camera. My camera has like no battery life. So they were like over here on my videotaping. And um, so the insurgents fucking, they end up driving off and um, we don't see them anymore. We're still waiting for artillery and artillery comes in late. And I'm like trying to capture it on video and the battery's dying. And then all of a sudden, boom! Like so, they were over here, like blew off to the left of them. I'm like, damn it, the hell! But so they dropped a bunch of rounds in, but they were long. Gone. Artillery's just, t artillery's tough, man. People don't on. people don't understand um, that it takes time to process the mission, you know. Yeah. And it, not only that, when you're in like Iraq and Afghanistan, even even just processing a mission real fast, like in training, where it's going to be as fast as possible. It still takes a couple minutes, but when you're talking about in Iraq and Afghanistan, now you're having to clear airspace. You're having to do all, you have to get approval from higher up, especially if I don't know what the ROEs were at the time, but usually they're, they're not really big about shooting artillery into a city if they no. don't have to, yeah. you know? 
Yeah. Um, so it's like all this, it adds so many layers to get a shot off. <laughs> and yeah. I've, no, I I've missed people with high Mars, which is, you know, pretty fast before I've missed people in, in Afghanistan with high Mars. Cause same thing that once it shoots, it's, it's in the air. You can't yeah. do anything about it. And then they, you see them finish up and then move away and you're like, fuck. And then boof, like, damn it. I missed yeah. it by 30 seconds. Yeah, they so. dropped. They dropped. They were big, man. They were dropped. Was a one twenty? Was it? What does a paladin shoot? The one twenty. Oh, paladin maybe? shoots a one five five. One five five. That's yeah. regular artillery. So yeah, they were dumping. Yeah, that's what Third ID was using. But um, yeah, they it, it was like they they dropped them. There was a field. There was like right outside the city, and like we weren't like in immediate danger, like you know. But um, you know, it is what it is. But yeah, we got attacked a, a couple times, really bad. And um, but that was just one of them. We had some Apaches come in. We ended up we, we had him sneak up on actually on the position. That's a whole other story. And we actually the next day we're like fuck that, and we set Claymore mines up. We took garbage bags and we hit them. We had Claymore mines set up, so if they fucking came up, we blow them to hell and shit. So we had those all set up and everything. But um, and it's so funny because like you, I think the hundred first came and they're like, you guys have fucking Claymore signs. We're like, yeah, dude, <laughs> it's, <laughs> like, it's legit they're here. Fucking, they're like they're trying to kill us, like. Fuck them, you know. You know why not? So you know, I mean, that, um, use the right uh, tool for the job. Like, damn, setting up claymores though. Did you guys ever have to pop any off? No, no, that's no. good. One, one did go off though. It was a um, test fire in a two forty into the grass. The, they cooked it off, and fire came back. And like mm. the fire started coming towards the wall where the claymore was, and they were like, "Fuck, it's gonna go!" I wasn't there for it. They're like, "It's gonna go," because they. It's not going to light the C4 on fire, but the blasting cap it did. So it blew one of them up. But um, yeah, that's a bunch of infantry guys. Yeah. I wonder if anybody's used a Claymore in combat and during the global war on terror, like actually set one off as a defense. I mean, they're a good defense tool, but they're not necessarily practical for a lot of what we've been doing since we've been in like cities and stuff. Yeah. The, um, well, the, the reason why we set them up, we got, we got attacked. So I'll give I'll, I'll just give you a quick story is this little house was like four people and um, we were in there and it was, we had it all like kind of barricaded off and sandbags and everything. We had radio, we called it and the patrol base was like, I don't know, like two miles down the street. So, you know, we'd hang out there for a little bit, but we'd be able to, and it was funny because the other OPs were like down the street from us. So you could hear them getting attacked once in a while and stuff, you know, they had mm. one guy, one of the one of the OPs. They got so close to, it, they threw fucking hand grenades into it and shit. The the uh, insurgents. So we actually. So this story is, I went on leave in in August of two thousand five. My first kid was born. Whatever. I just come back. So like, I'm actually out the OP with one of my sergeants and my buddies. We just we just came back from leave. So it's like this is our first day back in Iraq, and we're all just like hanging out. So I'm in my OP watching that field. The same one I said, and there's like. There's there's cars coming into the city and you know some foot traffic and we're sitting there and I see the Iraqi army come in, come driving in and I'm like ah and they they shoot warning shots all over the place, so my sergeant's like he's like on a cot like kind of passed out I'm like yo sarge I'm like yo he's gonna um the Iraqi army's coming through so if you hear AK fire it's you know no big deal he's like all right cool man thanks so he's sleeping. All of a sudden, you hear behind me, you hear all this fucking AK fire. Blah, blah. I'm like this. I turn around. I see my um, my sergeant jump in the bunker. He throws his vest and his helmet on. I'm like, oh, shit. And I see my two other buddies, my team leader and one of my buddies with a saw and a fucking 203 uh, M4. And they're fucking shooting into the woods. So I see rounds coming out of the fucking wood, like this bush tree area right next to our little op mm -hmm. and um so i just take the 240 i'm just like fucking brown t-shirt and like fucking throw it up and i just start fucking doing the predator on the uh on the wood line i'm just like rah, 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 rah. yo my sergeant starts shooting so i'm fucking just engaging the trees oh, i can't see where these fucking guys are they're fucking shooting i'm fucking engaging engaging i see an explosion in the fucking tree line and this is like 100 meters away I thought it was an RPG coming directly at me. I just see this fucking red fucking explosion. I'm like, oh, shit. I jump down. I look, and my sergeant's like, shunk. He just shot a 203 into the woods. Mm. So he's like, so he's just fucking lobbing grenades in there. We're just fucking unloading. Fucking, I'm, and I had just belts of ammo. I'm just going through. I'm fucking just cooking. Dude, they're screaming on the radio. Yo, we got fucking contact. It's like three dudes. I'm like, ah. So fucking, um. All the stuff settles. I'm fucking done. My sergeant's like, yo, ceasefire, ceasefire, ceasefire. I had like 15 rounds left. I'm like this. 
<laughs> finish that belt off. <laughs> finish that belt off. So every QRF shows up, everyone showed up. What happened was, so this house bordered a pharmaceutical plant, and there was like this giant barrier wall, and there was like a forest, like trees, like palm groves and shit. So these three dudes crawled up along the, our blind spot and got within like 50, 50 meters of us. And they just fucking jumped out and just unloaded on us. Mm. So we took, so our platoons like, fuck that. Went in there with the Bradleys, knocked all the trees down, started a fire, burnt fucking, you know, a ton of uh, brush and tree back, set like a whole fire, ran over like a pipe, water was spraying in the air. And like, so then we went in there, set the Claymore mines up under the garbage and stuff. And um, that was it. So they didn't kill anybody, but they never, they never came back after that. They yeah. were- <laughs> <laughs> I bet. <laughs> it's like, it sounds like you yeah, guys yeah. pretty much unleashed yeah. on them. That's I funny. Had the, it's funny. I had burns on my arms from uh, all the shell casings hit me, like burned and stuff. It was fucking. It was pretty wild. But that was my predator moment. That How crazy is that to come back from leave, man? One, I will say the one thing I did appreciate about the Marine Corps is that we did seven month deployments. <laughs> Unless yeah. you were going with the the regiment, you know, a regimental combat team or higher, which is basically like if you're going out with like the headquarters or whatever. Uh, they would do a year, but all the infantry battalions and stuff like that rotations were seven months, which is, yeah, you know, not a bad deal con- considering you guys always did 365 days. It, that was yeah. like the, so the plus normally or a lot, not normally, but a lot. Yeah. The um, unit, they redeployed the third time. I didn't go with them. They did 15 months. Yeah. That, that, oh, that's a long Does one, everybody man. get time off during that, during that? Does everybody get like a liberty <clears throat> period, like a leave and libo? We got, um what they call it so we got what the hell was it we got two weeks off r and r yeah and they'd fly us home so like i we jumped we went to a base in iraq they flew us to kuwait we they flew you to any airport you want in the u.s or actually no i think anywhere yeah so my 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 ex-wife was pregnant at the time so my platoon sergeant i think yeah that was the only one so he was like when did she do and I was like, oh, you know, like end of July, August. He's like, all right, when do you want to go? So they hooked me up. They let me go. So I went, it was like, he was eight days old. So I, I planned it so like he would be born, you know, like he should got induced. And so I can come home and I could see, you know, spend the whole two weeks with him mm-hmm. instead of sit, sitting around waiting for her to have it. And then she gives birth and then I have to go back in the day. So, um, but everybody got their, their two weeks. A lot of the junior guys, you, you know, weren't married and stuff. They kind of went early, but that was pretty much it. They did do a program where they did like they flew people to Qatar for like two days. So they yeah. sent a couple. They sent a couple guys, and like there was a type of uh, there was a lot of debauchery, a lot of craziness going on. So they're like, yeah, that's not happening again. So nobody ever went again. <laughs> and my one, the one big break we got, we went to Camp Spiker for eighteen hours. You know, we went swimming, went hanging out. You know, had some Burger King, and um, that was it. Back to the meat grinder. But yeah. um, but yeah, that's not, wild, was, man. Early in the GWAT, there, I guess there, there wasn't a lot of, you know, accommodations like there were later on. When I deployed, when I was there in 09 as a mechanic, this is, you know, they had guys, if you rolled over, because at the time you could roll over in the Marine Corps, they would allow you to stay in country and just join up with the unit coming in to replace your unit. Yeah, that's, and then that's when cool. you got back, you'd go back to your unit. So you basically do back-to-back deployments, 14 months. And if you did that, then they gave you an R and R period. And that's what they said is that they would fly you anywhere in the world, you yeah. know, and guys were single guys were like, fuck it. Send me to, you know, send me yeah. to Thailand or whatever, send me wherever. Yeah. And they're out yeah. having a good time. And then they come back to do the deployment. But we also had, there was a point in the deployment where they did that. What you're talking about, this was in 09. I don't know if I mentioned that, but they were saying, Hey, you pick the unit got to pick like two or three people and send them to what was it? Dubai or Qatar or something yeah, like Dubai, that? Yeah, Dubai. Yeah, I think it was Dubai. Or yeah. It might have been Qatar. I don't remember. Either one. But. I think it was Dubai. And they got to go there at some Air Force base for like a couple days. Yeah. And then and then just like chill. I think they got to drink. I think there was a concert. Yeah. There was a concert while they were there and stuff. So it was kind of like what you're talking about. It was a yeah. little, it was a little I just, loose. <laughs> I just heard a story of somebody that stole a golf cart and ran over and cut somebody's t- toe off. So oh, they're like, shit. yeah, fuck. Then, and like no more partying in the desert over there. We uh, were, when I was with the Mew, that's funny. Fucking higher up, you know, people, people messing <laughs> it up for everybody. Uh, when I was with the Mew, we were in Djibouti in Africa 
And there is a bar there where they allow you to get two drinks, I think, or something like that. It's mm -hmm. one of those deals where you can have like two drinks a day or something. And of course, the uh, higher ups have their, you know, their ways of getting more alcohol because they're higher ups and stuff. And I think one of our master guns on the ship, they kept it under wraps. I don't, not many people may know about this, but a master guns on the ship got like a DUI on in Djibouti on the base and a gator. And because of that, none of, no one else on the MU was allowed to drink yeah. there anymore. And we're like, what the fuck? Like the few of us that knew about it, we're like, man, that's bullshit. You know, like, yeah, yeah. that's the way it works though. Yeah. It's. It's funny you're talking about before how your deployment, how you're eating MREs, you only get hot meals every once in a while, and you're depending on food They're from your family and stuff. Dude, that was like, that's how I felt in Sangin. That's how it felt there. It was like, man, if you didn't get a care package or something, it'd be like, oh, shit. You know, yeah. like, that's a bummer. Um, and it's also interesting how you highlighted, like, how you go to other bases and they're like, Yo, we were like pirates. Yeah. <laughs> we were we were, we were like one, there was like, uh, was it one breakfast sandwich? And we we're like, like this, putting it in our pockets and shit. Like, and deployments just, differ, man, depending on who you were with and where you were at. Like I said, I was a mechanic. I was a support guy in my first deployment. I was in TQ and we had a chow hall. And, you know, you yeah. could go there and get omelets made. You could go there and get like 20 different kinds of ice cream or whatever from the fucking tea, whatever yeah. it was. Like they had all that shit. They had nice gyms and stuff. I mean, it still sucks. You're in Iraq and stuff like that, but it's not like what you were living in. Yeah. You know? So it's always I, interesting to hear about people's like when they start talking about their deployments. It's like, come on, man. You were on Leatherneck drinking coffee at fucking Green Bean. Like, what are you talking about? Don't, you know, that's crazy. Compared to yeah. like being in combat, like you're <laughs> laying out machine yeah. guns and putting down claymores and stuff. Yeah, it was. Um, I remember at some time because we we can't. So we had Brassfield Mora was our fob, and then we had the um the biggest base I guess was Camp Spiker. So a couple times guys would have to go to Spiker for something, like um, and there was a Burger King there. So I always remember like my squad. Like, anyone who went would bring back you know uh, whoppers from uh, a burger king and stuff and you get that whopper and you're like oh my god this is the greatest thing ever <laughs> <laughs> you know and like in america you won't even eat them you know it's just funny i was out but, in uh um, i was out in fob marja and they were like hey kramer you're going to leatherneck for this fires conference because i was the fire mm -hmm. at that time on that appointment i was the fires chief and they're <laughs> like you're gonna go to leatherneck and meet with the meth and whatever for this fires conference you'll be there for four days and everybody came to me with a list of like hey dude while you're there, yeah, go to the PX yeah. and grab this. I took a main ruck that was completely empty to go and like fill it up with all the stuff that people. Someone asked me yeah. to bring back a microwave. I was like, bro, I'm not bringing a microwave on a helicopter. Funny. Like, get the fuck out of here. That's but funny. That's what you asked for, though, when you're out there like living in like the dirt and stuff. But I guarantee, like, and I bet you will attest to this. I would have, I wouldn't have changed it for the world. Like when I left no, Marja and I went to Leatherneck, I was, I hated it. I hated it. Mm. I was like, this doesn't feel like we're at a war. This doesn't feel. This is weird. Yeah. I want to go back to where everybody's like, we're serious and like things are happening. Yeah. It's, um, it, it's, it's so funny though. Like in country that there's such a difference, you know, like there's people you never see and stuff. And like, and you go there and you see, and I remember like we got, I was, I got into a firefight with a couple of buddies and we were like in line talking about it. And we weren't like, Hey, you know what we were doing? We were just like, Hey, blah, blah. And like an E seven heard us. He's like, I know you guys are out there in the zone, you know, just keep, keep it down a little bit. We're like, 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 what is going on here? You know, like, keep, we're, I'm having a little conversation with my friend and like, you know, like, I got to keep it down. It's like, it is what it is. But <laughs> what, are you, what are you going to do? It's so crazy. I mean, the, when that happened, I, I got sent to Leatherneck and I remember they were like, hey, you know, you, your weapon has to be conditioned for, you have to like clear it every time you go into like the chow hall or all this other stuff. And I remember driving around the base and seeing silhouettes and some of the guard towers and stuff. And I'm like, this is fucking crazy. And then between yeah. that, between that deployment and my next deployment is when Leatherneck got attacked. And then the next mm -hmm. time I came through Leatherneck, it was everybody has, you know, ammo on them. Everybody's got, oh, you know, their weapon ready and yeah. all, like all the, it was completely different. And I was like, this should have been like that before, but everybody got relaxed, yeah. you know, and enjoying their deployment where they can go over to pizza hut after they get yeah. their green beans. So. I don't know, yeah. man. It's that's a, crazy. That's the thing is like, you know, like we'd go through ammo, you know, out on patrol and stuff doing, and we'd come back in and like, when you walked in, there was just a giant pyramid of ammo and you just go, okay, I need 5.56. And I go in my, you know, I go in the room, fill it up. And that, that was it. You know, there was like really no accountability for any of that. You know, <laughs> yeah. the only thing they, the gr grenades they kept accountability on, but everything else was, was like, you know, you need, you need 7.62, you need belt.
Hulk. All right, here you go. And then I was like, that's how it was. I wouldn't <laughs> trade it for the. I wouldn't trade it for the world, though. You know, it was a really good experience. We had a uh, a shipping container in Sangin. And it was like, open mm-hmm. up the shipping container. Like, okay, I need these. Uh, going to take this today. I'm going to take that. You know, like, here's so all. Uh, I'm going to take these smoke grenades. Yeah, it's funny. That's, it's de- definitely different. It's, uh, but you know what? It's like practical. Cause when you're, yeah. when you're at a fob in the middle of a country, it's not like I'm trying to steal rounds to, like, what am I, yeah. I'm yeah. literally, we're using these to fight, you know, like, this is, uh, yeah. Man, so when you 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 mentioned uh, or on your bio, it said that you had you got a purple heart from an IED. Was it yeah. from that first strike, or was that a separate one? No, it was it was later on. It was in April. It was April 9th, two thousand five. So we were just doing a mission. You want the whole story? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's 2000, 2005, It's April 9th. So like you know we're like we're you know seeing a lot of action and shit. And um, there was this there was you know a lot of people were getting killed. So they were like you know we're gonna like chill out on like the religious sites and anything that's kind of sensitive, you know, we don't want to like make, you know, piss everybody off so much. Mm -hmm. So then it got to a point where they're just like, fuck that. So one of the points, um, spots they wanted that was kind of off limits. They just wanted was a cemetery near one of the mosques. Like there was a big golden mosque that got blown up like a year later. But so this cemetery, they're like, they're hiding weapons in there, you know, at night they're sneaking in there after curfew and pulling weapons, IEDs and stuff like that. We want to go in there and do a search in the middle of the day. Like, all right, whatever. So my platoon goes. So we roll up and um, we got a guy with a metal detector and um, my Bradley pulls up, drops out. There's a red gate and the cemetery is kind of like an L shape. So we, we open up. So I'm the first guy in, I just end up being the point man. And uh, walking into the cemetery, my fucking ass is like this. Everybody's like fucking tense. We're all fucking looking, waiting to get ambushed, you know, get attacked. There's a lot of good, um, the, the, it's, the city completely surrounds it so there's lots of rooftops they can shoot at us from and shit you know they, everybody knows definitely that we're, what, what we're doing so we go in there so i'm on point to the right of me is the guy with the metal detector and he's going through now all the graves are shallow so it's like a cemetery but it's all like mounds of dirt for like where the different graves are and the headstones and everything so we start moving through and second squad hops the fence off to the left and they're moving through so we're all like in these big wedge formations and we're kind of like moving through and it's fucking, you know, we're going through nice and slow, metal detector, trying to find IEDs and shit. Tense as fuck. I think it was like 11 o'clock in the morning. You know, big, beautiful blue sky. We're moving through. And we, we just don't find anything. We find, like, remnants of stuff, like, like you know, like some um, pieces of, like, exploded ordnance, like, like just pieces of, like, a mortar round, this and that. But nothing too serious. My platoon sergeant, he's just walking around, picking stuff up, looking around, no fucks given. We're like, we go through don't find shit so I, we all take a knee we're all pulling security i remember looking at my lieutenant like yo sir yo, let's get the fuck out of here right he's like yeah, 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 yeah let's mount up let's get out of here so we all turn around and we start walking back the way we came so it's a giant l so i'm walking i'm point man this time now walking in i'm fucking like alert at the high ready on the way out i'm like <laughs> I'm kind of whistling i don't have sunglasses i left my sunglasses back at the base or whatever so I had my goggles on, these SSX goggles, and um, I was using those for my, they had like a tint in them, so I'm using those for my sunglasses, thank God. And um, I'm walking, so my squad makes the left, go towards the red gate, get the hell out of there. Second squad's moving forward. They they start to begin to hop a wall to go into an alleyway to get out of the cemetery. So I'm walking, and I'm coming real close to this red gate. I see it coming up, I'm looking. I look down at the ground, you know, I'm just kind of walking. Boom, the fucking earth just flies right up next to me. Right next to me, fucking dust smoke. Fucking, I go flying like four feet in the air. My rifle goes flying. I land on my back. The hole from the explosion is six and a half feet wide by three and a half feet deep. Fucking oh, giant, giant monster bomb. So I hit the ground, I roll over, and the first thing I do is I'm like, this is the initiation to an ambush. Like, they're going to detonate this fucking thing, and that guy's going to jump off all the rooftops and start spraying the fuck out of us. So I hit, I roll over and I start crawling. I'm like, ah. so I fucking crawl, roll over a fucking grave. My, I have a shotgun on my back. I pull my shotgun out. I'm like this. I look down. I start checking. I look and I start checking my legs. My legs are there. My crotch is intact. I look down and on my vest, I have blood and like a piece of skin. I blood like splatter all over. So I'm like, fuck. So I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking. This ear is ringing. This ear, not a sound. I'm like, those motherfuckers, they just, they blew my fucking ear off. I'm like, ah, 
oh, like, so I'm like this, and my finger, I don't want to touch it. I'm like, it's just going to be this fucking, like, slag of meat. So I'm like this, I'm like, it's all there. It's all right, good, good. I roll over, have my shotgun. I look, the dust, sm- all the debris, you know, raining down from the sky. I look, and everybody hit the dirt. And I see my lieutenant through the smoke, and he's like, <clears throat> he's like, Klein, you okay? I'm like, I got blown the fuck up, sir. He's like, don't fucking move. We're coming for you. So I'm just sitting there, fucking medic, badass guy, 18 years old, Delgado, fucking the man. He comes running over, grabs me. He's a little dude, grabs me, drags me out. My squad leader runs up to the hole, gets my rifle. They throw me on my back. He starts, like, fucking bandaging my face up and shit. And I'm laying on my back, and it's beautiful blue sky. Everybody's looking down top of me like, oh, fuck. My platoon sergeant's like, start fucking hitting all the houses. So everybody starts fucking, everyone's fucking mad as fuck now. They start going through all the houses trying to find the detonation guy. So I'm laying there. I'm like in a daze, like, oh, like what just happened to me? It's like, yo, you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. You're fine. Wrap me up. Once I got wrapped up, I stood up. I felt like, I'm like, I know I'm not going to die. I'm like, I knew I was, I'm like, I felt like a fucking badass. Now I'm like, I got like blood in my teeth and my face is all cut up and shit. So I hopped the fence. Join in with second squad. We start going through houses. Medic grabs me inside a house. He's like, "Come with me, come with me." Go into a room. He's like, "Yo, take all your clothes off from like the waist up." He wanted to make sure I had no puncture wounds that mm-hmm. I didn't know about, and my my adrenaline was going, so I didn't feel them. So I, I fucking undress. People in the house are screaming in the background, and everything. And um, what do you call it? So I have nothing. Put my shit back on. Like, all right. So we start walking out. <clears throat> so I'm gonna I'm gonna Quentin Tarantino this story. We're gonna go back in time. When we first got dropped off and we went in, a bunch of neighborhood kids came up to the Bradley and my friend's like, hey, what's up? So I throw candy to him. <clears throat> As he's throwing candy to him, a uh, military age male guy comes walking out and starts yelling and cursing at the kids like, get the fuck away from the Americans and that. So my buddy starts yelling at him like, fuck you. And he's like, yeah, whatever, whatever. So the kids run away and he walks away and he goes into an abandoned building right across the street from where I got blown up. So he paid no mind, you know, mention to it. And um, so later on, he's watching us come through. He sees me get nuked. He's like, oh, fuck. So he yells on the radio, like, yo, come in this building, go in this building. So I come out. I got I go back to the begin- the story I was at. I, I checked. I'm fine. I come walking out. And I'm walking and I hear around the corner, like, yo, we got the motherfucker. Second squad went up in that build, came back to that Bradley. My buddy's like, yo, check that building. They ran up in there. They found the guy in the third story. So he saw him. He was like trying to take his clothes off, his shirt, change his shirt. They fucking tackle him. As they're fighting him, he throws something out the window. They send the guy down below. They find a car garage door opener and they zip tie him up. So they bring him out. So they I, they have him around the corner. They're like, you motherfucker. So they're like, um, hey, Klein, come over here. Come over here. Yo, this is go guard the guy that tried to kill you. So they threw me in the back of a Bradley with this guy. And um, I'm face to face with the guy who fucking tried to blow me up. That's and, crazy. Uh, I took pictures of him too. I was like, hey, man, what's up? You know? But um, yeah, it was pretty wild face to face, you know? And that that's that was it, you know? Like the guy that tried to kill me and shit. I'm all bandaged up, you know? Holy um, shit, dude. That's such a surreal thing. Like no one has yeah. that kind of opportunity. <laughs> like, yeah, it, you know, and there's, you know, like, that's it you know it's, it's you know the, the cups are on there's nothing i can do you know but just being faced with the guy that fucking tried to kill me you know i have a fucking yeah. you know Damn. my wife's at home pregnant and this guy i was so fucking lucky man and um so we took him back they interrogated him they had like i think um what do you call it? like a military uh, intelligence officer came talk to him and then the iraqi army ended up taking him you know as a prisoner and shit but um you know they did the whole wipe of his hands and stuff you know it came up black with the ballistics and everything so, yeah, no, nah, so that was a fucking close call. I, I come back to the base and everybody's like, yeah, chest bumping me, high five. Like, you motherfucker, you <laughs> fucking, I heard you face plan an IED. You live to tell it. So, yo, very lucky. So the next day they come back in force, engineers and everything. They had to evacuate the cemetery three times. So, you know where the IEDs were hidden? As soon as you walk through the gate, they were all buried directly to the right. So, like, we, we missed it. Like, when we walked in, we looked a little past. And like missed it. They had RPK machine guns, RPGs, mortars. They had one five five artillery shells. They had all this shit buried in the ground. Thank God that IED didn't blow up and and detonate all that shit. Mm-hmm. It would have killed. It would have killed half my platoon. Like all my team squad mates, we would have got fucking nuked. But um, do you know what nah, you were hit? Was, do you know what you were hit by? Was it a homemade they, or was it a? They 
they said it was like a one five five round. I don't think so. I think I would have died. But um, still to this day, I I'm amazed that I didn't like lose a limb, have a, a a giant puncture of any sort. But You're it lucky, just man. all blew up, blew up like right next to me. You know, I got some shrapnel. I got like thirteen stitches, and like that was it. You know, and you know, I go so they bring, you know, I go to the medics. They look at me. They clean me up a little bit. Everybody's like my CEO's like fucking high fiving me. Like you're fucking badass, man. You got nuked. So that was all done. My my platoon sergeant is like, yo, listen, you just got blown up. Go chill in your room, play Xbox, whatever. I'm like, all right. So I went up there, and I'm like, I'm like, I actually called my 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 ex wife at the time, and she's like, my wife, and she's like, I'm talking to her, and I had a you know those combat earplugs, the three Ms, mm-hmm. those those famous ones from all the commercials. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the medics told me to like, yo, listen, your eardrum blew out. So keep that earplug in there, like. 24 7 just take it out a little bit when you take a shower but leave it in there because you might not you might lose hearing completely in there i'm like okay so i called her i didn't tell her what like, i just got blown the fuck up mm-hmm. and she's like she's kind of yelling at me she's like what's wrong with you you can't hear me i'm like oh yeah, yeah. like like the, it was the awkwardest conversation ever but i don't want to tell her i almost died and shit so i hang up with her i called my friend one of my friends back at Fort Stewart that didn't go over i'm like i'm like yo what's up bob he's like what's up man i'm like i just got blown the fuck up <laughs> so I go back to my room. I'm sitting down to play Xbox, and my uh, platoon sergeant comes in. He's like, "Yo, listen, I know you just got blown up. I told you to chill, but like, we're going back out. We got like this mission that just came up. Uh, like, I really need you. Could you? You he wasn't even telling me. He was like, would you, would you mind coming out? You know, because like we don't have a lot of guys. I'm like, absolutely. I threw my shit on, and I fucking went out there and did missions all night. You know, because like, God forbid, you know, my friends got killed while I was sitting there. You know, fucking having a sad Xbox, day. Yeah. So yeah, but yeah, jump right into it. I was all wrapped up and fucking went on, you know, went on mission with the guys. That's but, crazy, um, man. Yeah, you're that's lucky, I got dude. Blown up. You you're know. lucky. So many guys have survived because of like they buried it too deep or it was like a low order debt. Right. You know, we had a guy when I was with three six who jumped. He was um he was a sweeper, so he was out there with the metal detector sweeping, and he jumped a creek like a little whatever, a little wadi. To get to the other side, and he stepped, and when he jumped, he landed on a pressure plate IED, but it just caught on fire. It lowered or deaded because it was yeah. not made right or something like that. And Thank they God, were, man. I think they were like, I think that was like the fifth time or something that kid had hit an IED because he was the he was the battalion commander's uh, VSP, the um, whatever. He was a battalion commander's like lead driver, so he was out there with the mine roller. You know, so they were like, all right, man, this is, that's been enough. Like you're going to be on the base for the rest of the planet. Yeah. yeah. I, I'll, I have photos of it too. I'll send it to you and see, what, tell me what you think, you know, of all the different stuff you've seen, like what you think it was. They, they told me it was like a one, five, five round that was buried too deep. Dude, so, I have no I, idea. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not, so, I'm not a good idea. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, man. Don't My know. experience with IEDs was in Afghanistan and it was all yellow jugs. It was all yellow yeah. jugs filled with HME with the homemade explosives. You know, and it would be anywhere from like five to a hundred pounds. That was the thing. You know, if you talk to a lot of Iraq guys and then a lot of Afghanistan guys, the big difference in IEDs is in Afghanistan, there are way more, but in Iraq, generally they were way more powerful because the ones in Iraq were all military grade. It was all leftover military shit. Yeah. Um, in Afghanistan, it was all yellow jugs with homemade explosives. So depending on who made it, I mean, we had, I mean, I've told her this story a couple times, but we had, a, we were watching a six by M wrap, which is another big ass vehicle yeah, yeah. going down the road. We were watching it on the blimp, a convoy and it hit an IED and it was a hundred pound HME and it flipped it almost all the way over. It came up all the way, almost straight up and then fell back down. And that takes a lot, you know, so that was like a hundred pound one. But you would see five pound one, 20 pound ones like all over the place, you know. And then they started taking um, coffee cans and pouring wax into them with like uh, broken spark plugs and bolts and all that shit and putting the explosive behind them to make these homemade claymores. And they would, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they would put them in the, because all, did, did you didn't go to Afghanistan, right? You was just too no, Iraq? No, 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 no. So in Afghanistan, all the walls, all the compound walls are this mud. They make their own bricks and they, and then they stack them up and then they coat the whole thing in mud. So it looks like this giant mud wall. Well, they would dig out a part of the wall and put this can inside of it and then kind of cover it. So when a platoon or patrol would go by it, then they could pop it. You know, it was weird, but 
they yeah, do. dude, that's you're lucky, man. You, especially not losing a limb and stuff like that. I mean, so many guys and girls and stuff have yeah, have horrible. lost one. It's fucked up. But yeah. it is what it is. Like we said before, it sucks. Yeah, that's yeah. The game. Yeah, the EFP. Like I, what do they call them? EFPs. EFPs. Um, the ones. That's I had a friend got killed by one of those in um man. in Iraq, and like they went it went through like the hatch, like the weak point of the hatch on the Bradley and killed the driver. It's horrible. Fucking yeah. Horrible, the EFPs are the explosively formed projectiles for those that don't know. Yeah. And what they are is a uh, shape charge. Basically it's the, they, they have to, it's, they're hard to make cause you need a machine, you need machinery and stuff because they have to form a copper disc and it has to have a certain concave to it for the, for the science to work. And then they yeah. mount it in something like a coffee can or whatever, and then launch it. I remember when I was in Iraq as a mechanic, um, one of the vehicles I had to, we were doing some work on was an army vehicle and it had got hit by an EFP man. And it fucked that thing up. It went through the passenger side door. It went to the passenger side glass, that thick ass glass. And for those that don't know, the glass in these armored vehicles is like three inches thick. You know, the, the newer ones were like three inches thick. It was crazy. So, Went through the glass, went through the passenger's right wrist, went through the passenger's left knee, went into the um, the center part of the vehicle where, like, the transmission and stuff is, you know, between the driver and the passenger. Yeah. Went through that, went through the driver's knee, went through his, his ankle, and then into the floor. Like, that's yeah. like... You know, you can't stop that. You can't stop an EFP unless you have something like reactive armor, you know, and even that, I don't know. I mean, I'm not. It has to hit. The whole thing is like they, how they angle it. Like when they set it up, like my, my, one of my friends, he was a Bradley driver and he lost his legs. Like went up underneath it and, um, EFP got his legs and, um, just some, you know, fucked up. It's crazy, man. That was fucking, what? What are you gonna do? It's what war. are you gonna do, man? That's the that's why a lot of people nowadays say you can never win a war. A modern war can never be won because there's always gonna be an insurgency that'll be out there throwing yeah, out a lot. IEDs and shit like that. You know? They did a lot of crazy shit. You know, put them in dead animals. I never saw it, but the one story they're saying they're putting them in uh, telephone poles to decapitate crewmen and vehicles and shit, like gunners and stuff. I saw Fuck photos that. of them mounted to a pole um, on the yeah. backside of the pole. So maybe you wouldn't see it from a vehicle. I don't know. It seemed like a really bad yeah. placement, but did yeah. you, did you, how often did you run into like daisy chained IEDs? Uh, no, nah, never. The, Not a um, thing. Yeah. The ones we all like, they had to, you know what it, see, that's the thing is like, I never went to Afghanistan. So my assumption is like, Oh, that was the thing too. I'll give you, um, like, remember I said, like, camp, we'd go to Camp Spiker, like, once in a while for something? Mm-hmm. Like, I had dental problem, right? I didn't fucking say a word because to get dental, you had to go to Spiker. So now you're driving in Humvees. They wouldn't take the Bradleys out there. They take Humvees on these long stretch of roads of unwatched fucking roads because on the on the, on the MSRs and shit, they're not watched all the time. So they mm-hmm. can set up these giant IED science projects where they have daisy chains and all this crazy big shit in the city. All the IEDs were a lot smaller, but they had to be thrown out and gotten because people would call the the Iraqi army, the police, where they, you know, we would see them. Like they had to be real fast, pull up in a car, dig a hole, throw it in there, and get the fuck out. So like that was one good thing is we didn't have these monstrous IEDs. Like my one friend, one of my best friends, he was in um near uh, Route Irish in um what do you call it, near Baghdad, and he showed me a, a Louisiana National Guard rally that got obliterated. It was the worst rally I ever saw. It was, um, they had like, supposedly it was like 21, like 155 rounds set up and it fucking destroyed the whole thing. Like I never saw any of that because it was all, we were so on top of them and, mm-hmm. and it just was impossible for them to set that up without us not knowing or killing them. Yeah. I think stuff like that, definitely the main MSRs and they target these big ass convoys and stuff. Yeah. You know, they, like Afghanistan, I can imagine, you know, well like, in Iraq, I, I, the people I've talked to, like my buddy, Michael Hamthorne was a motor T operator and he was he would talk about like the daisy chained IEDs and stuff like that. Afghanistan, they would set up what they would do is, I don't know if I would call it necessarily a daisy chain in a place like, like Sangin when like three, five went there, man, Mm -hmm. they were like really good. They, what they would do is put in an IED and then they would also put in an IED where they know you would go to take cover. Like, Hey, that's a good spot for cover. Put another one there. And then that way, if you hit or you got ambushed or whatever, you go to these spots of cover and then boom, boom, you know, 
if you read, there's uh, the book One Million Steps by Bing West talks about um, three fives deployment to Afghanistan. I mean, like their first like patrol, they lost like three guys, you know, and it, in situations like that, it's that's like tough, you know. Yeah, um, it's a mind fuck, but you can't do anything about it. Oh yeah, you know? I mean, yeah, it, it, these IEDs, dude. Like, I don't know. I never felt bad like smoking an IED in place or. You know? <laughs> I was like, fuck that, dude. One yeah, time we yeah. hit a guy with high Mars and then we found out afterwards, you know, they always do the uh, sensitive site exploitation and stuff. Found out afterwards, he's the guy that built and emplaced an IED that uh, injured one of our platoon commanders bad enough that he had to get ba- evacuated back to the United States. So it was like, yeah. when you did that, it was like, sweet. Like, fuck. Like, yeah, fuck yeah absolutely. Dude. Yeah. Yep. It just, it stops everything. <laughs> yeah, fucking IEDs, man. So, you know, what was it after this deployment? What was for an average like army infantry guy, do you is there a like a want to go up to like go like I want to go be a ranger or I want to go SF like the next step or are most guys like okay with just being you know infantry? I, I I'd say fifty fifty. Like I had some I had some uh, buddies that went to range you know put in for ranger school and then I had one friend that went to, uh, SF you know he went to the old selection and everything like that so. I mean, I would have stayed in. The reason why I got out is I I just felt like there was an opportunity and I had, it was a door and I had to check it out. So when I was, when I got back from Iraq the first time, the NYPD came to um, Fort Stewart. So one of my friends that was from New York, one of the guys in my platoon, he was like, yo, they're giving the NYPD test out for free at the officers club. Let's go. And I was like, yeah, I'll take it when I get out. I don't give a shit. And he's like, no, 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 we need to take it now. And thank God I listened to him. So me and him went to the officers club. NYPD was there in their little polos, like, hey, we're the recruiters, you know, we're going to take tests. There was like maybe 100 people in the room. You just take the test, we'll give you scores, you get your CO to write a deferment, and the day you get out of the military, give us a call and we'll start your investigation, you know, if you want to come be a cop. So I was like, all right. So I took the test. They said, you know, I had passed and shit. My CO signed a letter. My CO was like, sure, you want to be a cop? I'm like, yeah, like, yeah, whatever. And um, so that's why I thought, I'm like, when I get, I get out, this is an opportunity. Let me see what happens. Mm-hmm. Also, too, is I was in during the stop loss period. <clears throat> so I my ETS was April of 2006. I had a lot of friends that were ETSing in October, November, December that were like, fuck it, I'm reenlisting because I'm getting stuck on this next 15 month deployment anyway. I might as well get the money. So I was kind of like, it's an opportunity. I have like a window, you know, whatever. I'm like, maybe this is like a sign. Let me let me let me check out this avenue. So I was like, if it doesn't work out, I'll, you know, I'll come back to the army. So um, it ended up working out, you know, like I literally got out of the army April 4th. I was on I-95 in Georgia driving up. I called my, my investigator. I saw my investigation three days later. I was in the ac- police academy in three months. Oh, wow. The, yo, like that. A lot of people I've heard stories, you know, they wait a year and a half, this and that. Like I was in the academy in three months. It was like no didn't even get a chance to hold my breath. <laughs> that, I mean, so, would you that, prefer, that I mean, that's it. probably better that way, right? Absolutely. So you don't yeah, gain absolutely. any bad, bad habits from absolutely. enjoying your time out of the military. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, no, hundred percent. So it just all worked out, you know, it's uh, it was all, you know, God's plan. That's what I believe in like, you know, and um, it worked out, you know? Well, what's the, um, what's the New York police department's police Academy like, and you went in and you're, you're a sketch artist did you go in to be just no. a regular patrol officer? And then that became, so, yeah, I just went. So the, the whole sketch artist thing didn't come till later. Okay. Like, I just went in to be a cop. So, um, that's the great thing about the NYP. There's so many crazy units and stuff that you can apply for and stuff. So yeah, I just went in as a cop. I go into the Academy and, um, you know, it was funny though. Cause I like, get every once in a while, you'd see like a, a guy, Afghan vet. I, like I went through, like you had to do a physical test, like, it was called the JST. I forget what it stands for, but it was like you had to run upstairs and carry a, a, a fake body and do this and that. And one of the guys I went with was a, a Fallujah Marine. So me and him were in line and they were like, the instructors are yelling at us and we're like, okay. He's like, you know, you're going to be out there. You're going to be wearing 14 pounds of equipment. And me and the Marine are like, yeah, okay. <laughs> but yeah, oh, nice. we, you know, we did all the, we did all the tasks and, you know, pushed through and um, I graduated and went to a precinct and I did midnight patrol. I drove around. I did like you know plain clothes stuff. I did um conditions. I did a bunch of different stuff. What year was this? And did what year did you start two, doing patrols? So 2007. So I went to the academy with six months. Graduated in December, and I was on the street in January, and um worked in Queens. I was a Queens Marine. That's what they they call them. 
And um, I did that. So I did that. I had a great time, worked with some awesome people, very blessed military and law enforcement. I've always been surrounded by it, just luckily by great people. And um, I found out about the sketch artist thing. And um, I pursued that. And that's a whole other story. And that worked out, too. Well, let's know. let's talk about, I mean, man, being a cop in New York City has got to be wild, right? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was good. It was good. Well, um, one, is that a, is that a, from a, you're a New Yorker, obviously. Is that yeah. a, like a pretty prestigious, like, job for New Yorkers? Like, how do other New Yorkers look at that? Because, I, I mean, outside of New York, especially after 9-11, everybody's yeah. like, NYPD, you know, like, oh, those, you know. That seems like yeah. legit. I don't know. Yeah, no, it, no, it is. It is. It's, um, I'm very, you know, I just retired recently. I just retired, uh, the end of December, but, um, I had an awesome career. Like, you know, there's ups and downs, like everything and this and that, yeah. but, um, I had an awesome career. I, I love being a cop on the street. I had a ton of great stories, a lot of great stories with guys I worked with and, um, you know, ch- run around chasing bad guys and, you know, some really cool, like my, 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 the precinct I worked in was violent. So it was very interesting and it was cool seeing like, you know, the whole military experience, then the whole, the whole law enforcement side and like, but, um, I feel like, I mean, knowing a lot of cops, especially guys that were former Marines or former military guys, I almost cops have way more stress on a day to day because we, you know, military guys, like we, we church our stuff up and don't get me wrong. Like what we do have done is legit, but we, come home train for forever and then go deploy for seven months or a year and then come mm-hmm. back and we're not in that situation anymore we're cops it's every day every like day. every day you're on a foot patrol yeah there's um there's there's different like like stress level. it's cool that's why i love it like i was able to experience both so i know like you know like i have my opinion on everything so like in like being in iraq in combat the one thing is like you have that fucking high stress level and there's no time to catch up mm-hmm where in law enforcement, like you get into a shooting or some crazy shit like that, you have a, you have a, to my opinion, you have a lot more time to unwind and relax and this and that. That's just, I'm talking about like traumatic, big, crazy stuff. Like Iraq, you're in a shootout. All right, cool. Good job. Go back out there. Shoot out again. You know, you go, oh, we got blown up by an IED. All right, cool. Go out there. Like, so that, that's what I believe a lot of like stress PTSD from like the veteran side. Now, law enforcement, like you get into it, like they do a lot. They try to do the best they can to accommodate you. Get involved in like a shooting and this and that. They spaced out. But being in law enforcement, though, like a, a cop on the street, you just have that everyday stress, you know. And you're dealing with, you know, people that are not. A, there's no, there's no fear. There's no, you know, ev- you know, they, you know, the locals see you roll up in a Bradley. They're like, oh shit, law enforcement. People are very comfortable about you. And there's always that, that, um, that threat of something going bad, like a car stop, a domestic violence dispute, a guy jumping out of a closet with a knife, you know, like mm-hmm. it, it has a lot. And just dealing with like, you're dealing with a lot of bad scenarios and that is a lot of stress. It has you know, to be that way, over. but it has to be that way too, because you don't want the general public to fear you, you know? Obviously. No, no, not at all. But it's just a different animal. Like for sure. Help, you know, like your, your mission's way different. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but also too, but like, it's, 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 it's being a cop's a tactical nightmare like going into people's houses and stuff like hey what's up you know what's going on what's up you're not coming at this level you're coming at a level of help and trying to you know solve a problem and like why you're there and stuff and then it turns violent do you you think uh, do you think doing that like interacting with the public in that way coming into homes stopping people's vehicles seeing people on the street did it like refine your spidey senses i guess like when someone's talking to you you're like this dude's fucking lying like this is not yeah, something well, about I mean, this a, is a not of, right a lot of it was the military experience like uh, me personally that's not everybody my opinion is i'm glad i had the military experience before i became a cop because mm-hmm. i saw everything in technicolor you know like everything was very obvious like you know some people walk into things like mm-hmm. like i like my whole thing was like, I lived through all this bullshit in Iraq. I'm not getting fucking smoked by some kid, you know, like <laughs> some dude it, Queens. Be, for me to embarrassing, like I'm way better. <laughs> I'm way better than that. It's not going to fucking happen. And this is what we're going to do. You know, it's uh, funny. Like I had, I had this one partner for a long time when I was a cop and he's like, you want to, I'm like, you want to partner with me? I'm like, yeah, yeah, let's partner up. He's like, all right, cool. Like we drove out to a parking lot and I had like my children's chalk, a sidewalk chalk. And I drew rooms. I'm like, this is how we fucking clear rooms. And I'm like, we don't go, we make people come to us. We do this, we do that. And he's like, all right. And like, after a couple of years that he was just a well-oiled machine, you know, but um, yeah, it's just, uh, I'm glad I had that experience going with this, you know, 
things cook off and a lot of gunfights in like the police department are real close, you know? So like you gotta yeah. be ready for it. When, when, as a police officer, this is kind of, this will be kind of political, I guess, but people are very, <laughs> people are very anti-gun, right? There's a lot of like anti-gun sentiment out there. There's a lot of like yeah, all yeah. this stuff and you know, Hey, it's how we'll get violence and criminals off the street. And it's like banned guns and all this stuff. How often were you like dealing with people that had illegal weapons? You know, I mean, was that almost every time or were, how often were these people carrying legal firearms and you're like getting into a firefight? Like, I just don't, I, I hate the narrative that, that all these guns are like being held by legal gun owners and they're getting in firefights with the cops. I don't believe that to be the case. You know, if that's not the case, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, but one, one, how often are you running into like what, what, we're now terming as ghost guns, you know, that are these illegal weapons. I never, no, I never saw, I, I never saw a ghost gun or any of that stuff. Like I, I haven't been on the street since 2015, like January, 2015. But, um, no, you know, like at that time, like the city was a lot different than it is now, 2015, like 2020, you know, the, the apocalypse, that's like the big change, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but, um, you know, people still went to jail for a while. The, they were pretty on, um, firearms are illegal firearms possessions so like you you wouldn't see it as much from all my friends that are in the field now pe people are carrying guns a lot illegal guns a lot more it's a lot more dangerous because people are just getting you know the where are they getting them at? where do you think they're getting these illegal a lot guns, a lot of them from down south you know yeah. down south brought them up yeah they bring them up down south they are stolen you know you always oh this gun was stolen off an oklahoma state trooper you know like four years ago like a lot of like dirty stuff like that uh, but um yeah they're just just moving them through but yeah all the bad guys have guns so you know that's you know whatever laws you pass it's not going to prevent that from ever happening that's the thing that know? kills me man i was i'll tell you what man i'm in san diego and i am my apartment is like right next to a main street and when the protests were going on in 2020 mm -hmm crowds of people were literally streaming by my place and i'm like dude they at some point had set set a, a, a bank on fire you know <laughs> i'm not yeah. too far from the freeway so they walked by my place to get to the freeway to try to stop traffic so it was like one of those things where i'm like what the fuck man i'd be super not cool not happy if i didn't have a gun right now you know like yeah i didn't need no, it no. obviously but like I think that opened a lot of people's eyes to the whole situation where they're like, holy shit, I'm at the, what? I'm at the will of the fucking crazy crowd out here. You know, like yeah. if they decide no to one, go crazy. No one's, then... to save you. Yeah. no one's coming to save you. You're on your own, man. You for know, sure. It's your responsibility for your self perseverance uh, and you're um, taking care of your family, man. There's no, you know, there's only so many. And like, that's the thing too about NYPD. NYPD is fucking huge. A lot Massive. of, I feel so bad for these other police departments. They're tiny. Like I was Wikipedia in it like two weeks ago. It's like NYP is like 33,000 people strong. It's fucking crazy. It's like a billion at, dollar budget too, right? It's like and crazy. Yeah. And then, and then the next, the next biggest police department, Chicago is 11,000, you know, and it just goes into LA is like 8,000. Like, it, you know, like you're on your own, you know, and like Chicago is way undermanned right now. That's a huge thing. Way undermanned, you know, like you make a phone call, like, you know, that's another thing too, is people are like, Oh, I don't want, I hate the cops. And then when shit goes down, it's like 911, you know? So, it's very, uh, very it's a weird sketchy. world. It's a weird world. It man. is. It's, a, it's very. So how did you, how did you come across this like sketch artist gig? Mm -hmm. So my friend from my buddy, I was in the army with in Iraq. He's the one that told me to take my test. He was like, Hey, you want to do an interview with Tom Brokaw talking about us in Iraq? And I was like, oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I went to the, the intrepid, which is, um, the U S intrepid, the aircraft Air world war two museum in New York, uh, New York city. And I did an interview with uh, Tom Brokaw for uh, American movie classics. And when I was there, there was another, uh, an NYPD, um, the public information guys are the guys that regulate all the information interviews and stuff for the department. They're like, Hey, I heard you, your friend said you can really draw. And I'm like, yeah. So the, I always drew, I went in high, in high school, I took art classes and stuff. And I always drew as a hobby, never in a million years, ever think it'd be a career or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So he was like, yeah, I heard you can draw. I know the sketch artist for the sketch artist. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, Oh, there's this whole unit where they do all the pictures you see on TV and shit. And I was like, absolutely. So he hooked me up with him, made a phone call. I went down, I interviewed, I took the drawing test. They really liked me. And their guy was, this is like 2011. The guy's like, Hey kid, we like you. He's like, unfortunately, you have to wait for one of uh, for me to retire. There's only three people. 
So I had to wait here for him to retire. So that was like 2011. He didn't retire till the end of 14. And then I got picked up in 15. So I just, you know, I went back to patrol and was just doing my thing. And um, when I got that phone call, I was doing cartwheels. And then, that, so I got brought into the detective bureau. I got my detective shield. got to work on a lot of cool cases and just did a whole nother, another side you know of my career so different than you know the military and running around the street mm -hmm. you know I, now i was doing like detective work and you know doing sketches and stuff like that and helping detectives in the field can you you want to explain the difference between like your average street cop and a detective for people that don't know well <clears throat> well detective is like a broad term there's so many different detectives mm -hmm. in the uh, nypd so i mean you have cops on patrol I'll, the basic is you have cops on patrol they answer 911 calls and do you know different law enforcement tasks Anything really big, the detectives are sent out. And any cases that aren't solved, that need further looking into, the detectives respond to, and they, they do all the work to find, you know, the, the perpetrators, the guys and stuff. And then, then the detectives, there's different units inside the detective bureau. There's homicide, cold case, you know, arson, explosion, you know, grand larceny for vehicles. They have all different types, of different units, you know. You know, detective units that work with the feds, for um, you know te terrorism, you know there's all different branches out, but it's more like spe it's like the next level of policing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so. I mean, that's just like I would have thought that that the sketch artist would have been replaced by computer programs by now. Yeah, thank God. Thank God it didn't happen that way. So <clears throat> the thing is, with with sketching, obviously now it's it's the cases have come down due to there's cam there's cameras there's video everywhere, but so like back in the day like there was nothing so you would have to bring the witnesses in so and there's still like tons of like high high profile cases that come and they have no video footage and you know the public demands an answer and like that's what we're there for and uh, like i'm like the, i was like the last le you know last leg of hope to get something out there to get the case moving and stuff you know to find out who this guy is so but um yeah there's still a job for it, it it's definitely come down but um was it weird you know, sitting down with victims and stuff and like no, having this conversation with them i mean part of the interview process is they want you to be personable because like if you can't uh have a rapport with somebody you're never gonna find out mm -hmm. you know what's going on and some of these people you know you you one person turn the victim turns off to you you're gonna miss that detail they're not gonna say oh he had a scar under his eye they're not gonna give you that feature they're gonna give you not a great sketch so like being you know and it's also too like when you're doing the interview you kind of they're reliving that tragic event you know whether a rape or murder or something like that so it's so important that you you have that connection with them how does that affect you hearing these crazy ass stories like all the time i mean you're not you're not doing sketch <clears throat> sketches of like nice people they're telling no, you about no. these yeah, vicious not. horrible events yeah you just um it's part of the job you know and you know i had you know, I had my experience in Iraq and then my experience on the street. So it's just, you know, professional at all times. And I'm, you know, bringing my A game to these people. And I'm there to make, you know, to use my talent to help them to the best of their ability. Also, too, like me doing it, I always thought of it as therapeutic to a degree. Like it's them, mm. this person who feels powerless at the time, you know, because they were raped, sexually assaulted, you know, injured, that they're getting back at this fucking guy. Like they're doing what they have to do to get this guy locked up and brought to justice, you know? Yeah. Um, man yeah. that's just such a it's such a like uh crazy gig to have <laughs> i mean oh, it's how, very blessed <laughs> where you know witness statements are a lot of times thrown out in court and stuff like that because they're inaccurate how often were you getting information from people like how often were your pictures accurate compared to not accurate like once you saw the actual perpetrator i imagine you oh. always like look to see like how yeah, close yeah. you were most of them are really on point, you know, sometimes I had some, de you know, deceptive cases where people were telling a story and stuff like that. But, um, most of the time they look like the guy, you know, like if you get a good witness, you know, you'll get a good drawing. So I had a lot, that was one thing too, is great. Is like in my, my time there, I did it for eight years and, um, I had a lot of cool cases, a lot of interesting cases, you know, a lot of media cases, a lot of big, mm -hmm. you know, you know, a lot of accolades met a lot of people and, um, I was able to, um, you know, help out and it's a uh, very rewarding. If, I mean, that, there's a job like that in the military for sketch artists. There's oh yeah. A, yeah. I know. Yeah, the, I saw in the Marine. I know the Marine Corps has one. I assume the army does. I mean, you guys have, I have hundreds no of thousands idea. of people. I, if, if I the two people, yeah, on oh, Instagram, there's two artists. Who's that? Who are they? JB. I, don't know, I have to look Give it up. Give them a shout out. 
uh, while you yeah, look, no. um, I gotta dig it out. Would you would you switch jobs? Would you have gone and done that instead of infantry? You think like if they if, um, if the opportunity would have arose, like hey, you can go be a sketch artist for the military. Maybe after I had that initial experience, like like I joined the like I joined the army because I wanted to fight. Like, you know, like I wanted to go in and, and you know, I wanted to get, you know, 9-11 was Pearl Harbor to me. I wanted to get in there and get in a fight. And um, that was that that was more to me than anything then. So maybe after I had my fill with that. Yeah. Were you in, were you in New York when 9-11 happened? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you yeah. see? I mean, obviously, I don't know. I've no, never been in New it. York. Did I mean, did you saw the towers afterwards? Like, yeah. During, yeah before saw, they collapsed it, or. Yeah. No, 100 percent. So I had um, my dad's cousin was actually like head of security there. Oh, and sure. he actually re he retired a year before he was on in 1993 when they had the first bombing the car bomb that blew up there he was on vacation and then he retired the year be um before it blew up and the woman that replaced him she died she perished in the in the towers so but you know i experienced it just like everybody else you know like i was driving i was actually carpooling with my um my manager this girl i went to high school with and we were listening to the radio and we heard like oh plane hit you know the trade towers, and uh, at first I was like, "Oh, it's like a Cessna or something," you know. Mm -hmm. Then we we I got I, I was working in retail, and th we turned on the radio, and like another plane hit, and then like we turned on the TV, and we saw like, "Oh shit!" And I remember I called my dad, and um, I was like, "Dad, what the fuck's going on?" And he's like, "Yo, they just hit the Pentagon," and I was like, "No," I told him like, "No fucking way! We're the greatest country." the most powerful country in the world. And they just hit the Pentagon. No way. He's like, turn on the, look at the channel five, or whatever. And I turned it on. It was just like, it was horrible. And then, you know, some people, I, I knew one guy that actually was in the building. He got out safely. Thank God. But, um, just like a gut punch, you know, turning on the news and seeing that, you know, horrible, horrible. And it, another thing I was telling you earlier, remember with the mortar, like you never see fire, mm -hmm. like the trade center, there was fire everywhere, you know, like, most fire ever you know the jet fuel burning up just really just a horrible day yeah dude i mean you say you experienced it like everybody else not really because <laughs> i grew up in indiana i grew up in tennessee and indiana and had this is i mean people got to remember too this is like early internet day so i wasn't yeah. i didn't even know what the world trade center was when someone told me like no, hey the world trade center got hit by a plane i'm like okay like yeah. what the fuck is that you know like i don't even know what that is um and then, then when I turned on the TV and I saw it, I was like, oh, shit, like, this is crazy, you know, like, but yeah. to be a New Yorker, like, I feel like that's just a whole different kind of thing, you know, like, yeah. I don't know, man. A, a lot of military guys were, you know, FDNY and NYPD patches overseas and stuff. It's just um, crazy. And it's like, it's crazy. Like, my, my girlfriend at the time, she was working for Disney. She was doing like the college program down in Florida. Mm -hmm. So I called her up. I'm like, yo, babe. <laughs> she's like, she's like, what? She's like, oh, I'm still sleeping. I'm like, wake up. The fucking trade centers are gone. They blew them the fuck up. She's like, are you kidding me? I'm like, turn on the news. And a couple of the girls she worked with were New Yorkers too. So they all, you can hear them all turning on the TV and everybody's just like, just a Who's real, that? really horrible day. Dude, so crazy, man. Well, that's, I mean, I can see why that kind of pushed you to want to join the military. I'm sure there were a ton of New Yorkers that went right yeah, into the military absolutely. after that, you know, like, I mean, tons of America. First time I called the recruiter was like a week after that happened. You yeah. know, I was like, all right, man, like me and my buddies were like, dude, pff, we just got Let's attacked, bro. This is our fucking, yeah. like we're seniors this in high school. Our, yeah. Yeah. That's the dude. thing is like, like I had nothing really going on. And like, to me, I'm like, Oh, you know, do your fucking part. Get out there. You know, there's a fight. You can be a part of it. And, um, you know, I felt that whole, like my grandfather, you know, my parents were like, oh, you know, but, um, was there, it. is there like in the NYPD, was there a line, you know, of like, ooh, my dog just hit the camera. Was there a line <laughs> of like, these guys are pre nine 11 police officers. And these guys are like post nine 11 police well, officers, not a line. Like well, these guys are better or anything, but just like, we know who's who like, yeah. Well, like in the medals, like you wear, um, they have a world trade center bar. So if you were serving when it happened, you, you could wear it. So, okay. so my, yeah, like my, my wife, she was a cop when it happened and she went down on the pile, you know, the next day and um, she has pictures and stuff. And it was just like, you know, her stories actually being there when it happened, she graduated in 99 from the police academy. So for, you know, hearing her experiences actually being there, you know, and in the, you know, how it affected the whole department. So it's pretty, pretty wild. But um, just the, just the amount of casualties, like, the fire, the fire department just lost complete trucks, you know, ESU emergency service. They lost a ton of guys. It's like, yeah, it's a real, real sad day and never forget it. You know? 
Yeah, man. I mean, just completely insane for sure. I mean, how could it not be right? Like it's just such a, such a defining moment for that time, you know, in our lives and stuff like that. Um, my dog is going crazy. So I'm gonna have to wrap this up uh, before he knocks over my camera. Where can uh, everybody find your stuff? Um, so I do my side art and stuff and all my crazy antics and everything. You could see, um, on Instagram, Matt Rendar, M A T T R E N D A R. So, and that, that will show you all the wild stuff I'm up to. And it's cool. It's cool. Now, since I'm retired, I'm sharing my uh, detective cases. I've been doing like a, yeah, that's what I was was super interested in when you, I saw, I saw those posts. Those are really cool. So yeah, it's cool. Cause like, like every, like, I know it's so every, every picture has a story. It's a hundred percent the truth. Like mm-hmm. every one of those faces has a whole story, backstory and everything. So I've been sharing that lately, but um, yeah, I just do, a, I do a lot of nerd art, military artwork and stuff like, you know, and um, just check it out. Matt Rendar on Instagram. I love the artwork, man. I think you do a really oh, good thanks, job. Man. People need to check it out. Um, I don't know if you do a lot of like commission gigs and stuff, but if you do, hopefully people reach out to you because super good art. I saw your uh, rap patrol photo from the other day. No, That's yeah. super oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very cool. That's such yeah, a cool image. That. Yeah, that was a commission piece I did for um, a friend over in England. But, um, yeah, those guys, wild too, man. You read those stories about the SAS, you know, Crazy. taking out German airfields in uh, Tunisia. Wild. Yeah, I heard about it because my dad used to watch that show, Rap Patrol, when I was the Rap a little Patrol, kid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, really cool, man. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, man, everybody can check out my stuff. JayKramerGraphics.com is on my website, at Former Action Guys, at Former Action News on Instagram. And that's it. Hit me up, subscribe, and all that stuff. Thanks again, Matt. Thanks, I really man. appreciate it. Always.